Uh, good evening. I would like to warmly welcome um, everyone to this evening event on um, the role of architectural competitions. Firstly, of course, the speakers, uh, the moderators, and our audience. Uh, my name is Tina Grigoric, and I try to navigate the two roles within the architectural profess uh, profession as a professor here at the TUB, and of course, on the other hand, as the co-principal of an architectural practice, the Kleva Grigoric Architects. Um, Architectural competitions have been one of the key fields of the research as our research unit architectural typology and design, part of the Institute of Architecture and Design here at Vienna University of Technology. And together with Thomas Aman, we have been for years conducting a series of um, events and conducting the course with the master students in order to get in some sort of the depth of this intriguing um, part that somehow shapes the history of architecture. So we've known that uh, architectural competitions have uh, been contributing to this decisive turns um, in the architectural history, and of course in the current condition of that, and therefore we try to uh, stay in touch and try to get deeper into the knowledge and the background of this particular instrument and the procedure. Uh, for this year, we, uh, we were extremely ambitious. Uh, we tried to somehow bridge the gap between uh, the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, so we tried to uh, connect uh, and we invited Jean-Pierre Chopin, a professor at the University of Montreal, to somehow become a guest professor here at TU Vienna and together with him to organize these two specific online symposia, which Today we will witness uh, the second part. I would like to um, welcome you and somehow invite you to a very intriguing discussion. Um, and now I give my word to Thomas Saman. So, uh, hello, welcome everybody. I'm, I'm Thomas Aman. Thank you, Tina, for your introduction. Uh, and after last week's debate on the democratic uh, nature of competitions, we will today focus on the potential of competitions as laboratories for innovation, as the title says. Competitions have always been inseparably connected with the myth of innovation, also charged with that myth, as an opportunity for young architects to succeed against established uh, colleagues and to win commissions, of course, and as a driving force to promote new solutions, new models, new ways of thinking um, at the architecture discipline in general. It is embedded in the logic of the discipline as a field of cultural production that we, at least a lot of us, are not only looking for the best solution, a project for a specific situation, but that at the same time, uh, the discipline, its condition, its further development are always at stake in competitions. But as optimistic as this theoretical argumentation might occur, it is complicated in reality. Not always are competitions a kind of carnival putting the world upside down. Not everyone is convinced of the necessity of a constant renewal and competitions do not always promote new solutions, at least not above a certain degree. Of course, there are some radical innovation through landmark competitions leading to paradigm shifts even in the field. But we often forget about the everyday architecture where it's nonetheless important to constantly improve, not for us, but for the users, for the society and environment as a whole. Although this innovation probably goes in smaller steps. So it's not a given that competitions promote innovations and probably there's also a lack of debate and knowledge of for sure a kind of misleading reading of the term innovation in architecture. That's why our aim with today's discussion was also to try to demystify at least a little bit. So we are interested on the one hand today in the ambitions and motivations. So what triggers innovation in competition in the first place? A burning question, a challenging brief, intrinsic motivation. Secondly, what kinds of innovations do competitions produce? What content, what degree or extent? How can we manage innovation or organize knowledge within competition processes? And finally, where do innovations go? 
what paths and detours are there for ideas to come to the world through competitions. We have again invited um, five guests. Uh, it's uh, Bechara Elal from uh, University de Montréal. As a researcher on the topic, very influential for us at the very beginning of our own agenda. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we're happy to have Benjamin Bos uh, Hosbach, sorry, uh, co-founder of Phase 1, as experienced organizer of competitions. With Wilfried Kühn, co-founder of Kühn Malvetzi Architects, Berlin and professor at TU Vienna, as a participant in numerous uh, competitions. And PSLA architects, Lilip Schiel and Ali Segatores Lani, as a, a kind of local heroes reporting uh, from the Viennese front a little bit, I hope. Uh, we will hear on the procedure now uh, for pre-recorded, I have to say, um, statements, presentations at the beginning, and we will discuss the questions I just introduced in a roundtable format for an hour uh, after that. Um, questions of the audience, of you all watching this, uh, will be able to, to, to be posted via YouTube chat and will be brought in into the discussion at certain stages. So I wish uh, all of us and everyone watching a, a, a nice evening and I'll hand over to uh, Jean-Pierre. Thank you, Thomas. Well, first I would like to thank uh, Professor Tina Grigorich for this and the TU Vienna for this wonderful invitation and Thomas for an incredible work uh, behind all this. It's a wonderful opportunity for us uh, in Canada to exchange with experts, uh, European experts. I mean, we have people like uh, Wilfried Kuhn and Benjamin Horbach who actually know uh, of the Canadian situation for winning competitions or for organizing some of the most important competitions of the century, which I should say. Um, the situation in Canada is very different from what you experience uh, in Europe in terms of uh, the role of competitions, but Nevertheless, we have developed a series of, uh, I would say, researches called international uh, uh, publications. And I'd like uh, Thomas to uh, display uh, uh, um, these three books, not so much for the sake of publicity, but to, uh, um, to mention the, the, the last production that uh, is in open access, Young Architects in Competitions, when competitions and a new generation of ideas elevate architectural quality, which was published last year with my good American friend, uh, Stanley, Collier from uh, competition.org. I want to mention this book because I think the issue of uh, um, you know, the role of young architects, which is sometimes a myth, but is sometimes a reality needs to be addressed today when we talk about the experimental, uh, uh, I would say uh, value or the experimental nature of competitions. So last week we dealt with um, competitions as political devices. And today we try to focus on um, innovation and experimentation. So I'm very, um, uh, thank you, Thomas. I'm very grateful uh, to um, uh, all the speakers for uh, sharing their views. We, you're gonna enjoy first the presentations in a sequence. We're gonna alternate with a couple of comments in between two videos to avoid the, you know, the lengthy presentation. And then we will start with a series of questions. Please um, uh, uh, formulate your questions in the, in the audience and, and uh, Thomas and, uh, and Tina will select the best questions for us. So uh, please be provocative. We want a good debate today. So Thomas, uh, I think we're gonna listen to uh, PSLA as presentations, I think. So I'm happy to introduce our first speakers. It's uh, PSLA architects, Lilip Schill and Ali Segatolislami from Vienna, who I appreciate not only for their ambitious entries to competitions in, in, in Austria and abroad, for instance, for Bildungscampus or Educational Campus competition series, notably the winning schemes for Bildungscampus Hauptbahnhof in partnership with PPAG and Bildungscampus Beresgatze, which I find one of the best actually one of the best buildings in Vienna recently finished. Um, but who I also found extremely interesting after speaking to them during my research, thanks Ali, uh, in regards to their approach to design and, and particularly what role competitions uh, do play in their kind of methodology. So I'm very happy to have them as a guest and uh, please enjoy the video. 
Hello, my name is Ali Segatul Islami with Lilip Schiele, co-founder of PSL Architect in, uh, in Vienna. Uh, we look forward uh, for the symposium organized by uh, Jean-Pierre Chupin, Tina Gregorich and uh, Thomas Amann, uh, Policies and Qualities. Um, for us, entering competitions has uh, always been an intrinsic means to logically develop our own understanding of architecture. After entering a series of competitions, this soon became, uh, became a testing field for us, not only operationally, to end up with a project as an object that is the best for a specific solution, but to be able to further develop and extract the DNA of the project that can be transformed to the next project. The specific and um, literal articulation of one architectural project or competition entry results in a more um, general type or formula or a diagram that can be easily um, the starting point of speculative design in the next project. Um, since 2010, the city of Vienna uh, has been organizing a series of uh, Bildungs campus or educational campus competitions. We took part in five competitions of which we could realize uh, two projects. Most of the Educational campus projects roughly comprise around 450 single rooms for up to uh, maximum uh, 1,500 children from kindergarten to secondary school. What makes these projects um, and competitions so intriguing and interesting for testing topology is in having to negotiate between producing small and introverted cozy playing and learning areas within a structure uh, the size of a large urban infrastructure building. Um, the competition briefs between each of the competitions uh, show a great level of programmatic analogy um, with the city administration in Vienna themselves um, uh, utilized as a testing ground by introducing different uh, focuses each time, low-tech architecture, cluster sizes and constellations, incorporating physical exercise, margin between public and private use of the properties, uh, outdoor learning, new forms of pedagogy, etc. Um, all the different specifics of the competition brief introduce irritations or inflections in the generative layout of the approach, which uh, kicks off uh, a total reinterpretation of the initial diagrams uh, or the generative layout of the idea. Um, because of the innovative ambitions of the client and the complexity of the brief itself, we have been taking part in using um, this series of competitions is a testing ground for innovative stimulation of studies architectural evolution understanding. Um, I will try to provide you with a history of uh, an evolving type uh, in different competition entries. Uh, we called it a kaleidoscope, kaleidoscope uh, radial configurations um, that allow foster and multiply the spatial relationships of each architectural element in the context of the alignment towards inside or outside of the building. A year before entering the competition of Bildung Campus, uh, Bildung Campus Bereskasse, that our office completed in 2019, we were experimenting with non-orthogonal uh, arrangements in learning uh, environments in a, at a competition for a secondary school building in Stammersdorf in Vienna. Uh, we called it uh, kaleidoscopic configurations. In context of the Bildung, Bildungscampus Bereskasse, with regard to its size and complex programmatic structure, uh, we tried to develop and rearrange the kaleidoscopic approach to complexify the different functional and spatial relationships at a much bigger scale at the campus. We ended up um, introducing a multitude of typologies, multi-oriented hall structures, bridge-like structures, and star-like radial configurations of clusters on top of a plinth. Um, so the realization of the kaleidoscopic types of the previous competition entry had a totally different architectural implication on the building of the Bildungscampus Bereskasse. And then during the building phase of the Bildungscampus Bereskasse, we took part in an invited competition organized by the city of Vienna for educational campus with a programmatic focus on low energy consumption and ideas of low tech, Bildungs Campus Atzkastor. The programmatic layout of the competition brief was again very similar to Bereskasse, but some input information had been added and changed. So we had to alter, reassemble, reconfigure and revisit the initial diagram to be able to find a specific solution for the final project. Um, 
And a couple of months ago, a year after the completion of the campus project in Beresgasse in Vienna, we entered an invited competition in the city of Berlin, where we further developed and, uh, the radial uh, or kaleidoscopic configuration of the building into a hexagonal torus or ring. Um, we initially kept the idea of a self self-reflexive multi-dimensional structure as a as in Stammersdorf and Beresgasse, but um, but inverted the global configuration we were testing in Askersdorf to end up uh, with the manifestation of a hollow circular model. In this sense, competitions in series become an open end innovative tool for us to generate uh, a cumulative uh, architectural intelligence that in a way uh, synchronizes uh, the um, continuity of past and present uh, projects. A more speculative and logical experimentation with types and typologies rather than a personal realization of a catalog of subjective wish list of us as architects or just a literal uh, response to the competition brief. Um, we believe that uh, recursive application and experimentation with irreducible types is one of the most uh, basic and vivid uh, tools for architectural design and innovation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ali. And I should say Lydia and Ali, because this is a truly uh, uh, teamwork, of course. Uh, thank you also for choosing a, a clear and concrete example of the role of uh, competitions in the production of new typologies. So we, we will be coming back to this uh, notion of disciplinary innovation, which, we, which you perfectly uh, exemplified today. So uh, our next speaker is uh, Professor Bechar Ailal, um, who is uh, architect and engineer and also uh, the, the interim director here at the University of Montreal. And he's a member of the LEAP Lab, Laboratoire d'études de l'architecture potentielle, <coughs> potentielle, sorry. But he's also um, an expert uh, in experimentation, uh, in, in, on the question of experimentation and laboratories uh, in architecture, and he wrote a PhD thesis on laboratories in architecture. So please enjoy um, Bechara's presentation. When I first started reflecting on the notion of experimentation in the context of competitions, I went back to Helen Lipstadt's book, The Experimental Tradition. In this book, Helen Lipstadt states very clearly that she does not believe there is a historical association of competitions with great style forming moments of innovation in architecture. Rather, what is experimental about competitions is the process itself, because these ephemeral events with permanent results are endlessly repeated and always changing. What these quotes highlight are two major questions that need to be addressed. The first one is, what is the nature of experimentation in architecture? The second one is, what do architectural competitions produce? On the first question, we have to go back to the scientific field. In the sciences, the experimental method is a research process that builds new knowledge. Um, it's a very rigorous and organized process that starts with a research question that includes the design of experiment, the measuring of the results of these experiments, their recording, their evaluation, which eventually leads to the construction of a scientific fact. This is somewhat different from the arts in which experimentation is seen as a research posture geared towards the production of innovative works. This is quite evident in the manifestos of the avant-garde, and the experimental works they produce are meant to test new ways of doing things in order to define a new and still unknown future. So experimentation is always research, but it's a different kind of research. Uh, it's either a process for thinking that builds new knowledge, or it's a posture, a stance for making that builds new objects. And experimentation in architecture is a bit of both. It's a bit of scientific experimentation, and it's a bit of artistic experimentation. The history of architecture is full of experimental architecture. One could think of Bernard Schumi's Manhattan transcripts, for example, that he developed in the 70s, uh, which is very similar to the kind of project he will produce for the uh, Parc de la Villette competition in 1982. The 1982 Parc de la Villette competition is a remarkable competition because from the get-go what is asked from the competitors is not only the production of an object, an urban park, but also a model for all 20th century urban parks. In other words, a proposal for a new future, a new way of designing parks, an experimental project. 
And this is exactly what Bernard Schumi produces when he designs the winning scheme. What is most interesting is that the runner-up to the competition is almost project, which is as important in the history of architecture as Bernard Schumi's proposal is. References in architectural publications to both these projects have increased exponentially since their inception in the 1980s, and they have both become today models that illustrate new ways of producing architecture. What is most interesting is that both these projects are also the actualization of models from the past, basically from the avant-garde of the 1920s and 30s and of the avant-garde of the 1960s and 70s. So architectural competitions can produce experimental architecture. Now let us consider experimentation as a process. There is a clear analogy between the experimental method in sciences and the competition process. This process starts with a competition question, which will be followed by experiments, which are the competitors' proposals, that are measured, recorded, and evaluated, and eventually this would lead to the selection of a winning project. What is most interesting is the recording of the multiple proposals, which will enable the production of a database of competition projects. In the case of the La Villette Park competition, such a database will be produced right after the end of the competition through the publication of a book containing the plans of all the proposals. This is a database of somehow organized information that contains what I would qualify as potential knowledge. This potential knowledge will be turned into actual disciplinary knowledge about 10 years later through the work of Lodevic Ballion, one of the competitors. Through a thorough process of comparative analysis of all the 1982 competition proposals, Ballion identifies new conceptual and operative strategies and formulates a theory of urban parks for the 21st century. In this sense, the Parc de la Villette competition is a perfect example of how the architectural competition is a process that can produce simultaneously, on one hand, experimental and innovative objects, and on the other hand, to an experimental process, new disciplinary knowledge. I would conclude with this 1938 quote by Talbot Townend that I believe it summarizes well the links between experimentation and competitions. Competitions lead inevitably to experimentation and design, and the effect of the experimentation will be seen not only in the building finally erected, but even more in the education they give to juries, to architects, to clients, and to the public. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bessera, for sharing your knowledge. Um, I truly think that the case of Villette uh, presents a great opportunity to see and understand what could be important for innovation to emerge uh, through competitions. Uh, so in that case, not only a huge, in this case, a presidential even uh, ambition translated into a challenging brief and the selection of people involved in the organization and the, 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 the judgment, but also a kind of uncertainty in the field, a kind of young generation, I think Jumi was 37 when winning the project. When this young generation being allowed to participate and being highly charged with new theories and positions. So at the same time, it was a huge pull effect from the objective and, and challenge of, of the competition and a high pressure push, one could say, from within the discipline. So, but I also found it very interesting the definition of what experimentation architecture could mean, especially in competitions, almost as a kind of reflection also on, on Lili's and Ali's uh, contribution before. Uh, so that's, I found very interesting and I'll be sure we will discuss in depth uh, at later stages. Uh, Wilfried Kühn is our next guest. Uh, he's co-founder of Kühn Malvezi Architects in Berlin, Germany, and also professor and head of department at uh, TU Vienna at the uh, Research Unit for Spatial Design. With Kühn Malvezzi, he was part of several competitions in various contexts and scales. Um, they are well known for several winning but also losing schemes, I should say, for their conceptual and often critical approach uh, within competitions. So, for instance, for a mosque in Pristina, for the Berliner Stadtschloss, and recent, more recently also for a museum for insects uh, in Montreal, Canada. So, uh, listen to what he says.
Competition is fundamental for democracy. It is a way to generate equal access and a way to generate individual ambition while deciding collectively. It is a way to foster autonomous ideas and concepts. According to the liberal textbook, competition results in the selection of the best. A fictional character, an architect modeled after Frank Lloyd Wright in Ayn Rand's novel The Fountainhead, became a hero of Wall Street neoliberals in the 1980s, not by chance. Competition seems to be what both architects and neoliberals worship. At least that's the appearance. For better or worse, it seems the opposite if you look more closely. And we can see why, looking at the first international architecture competition of the 20th century, the Chicago Tribune Tower of 1922 won by Raymond Sidelining modernists like uh, Lohs and Hildesheimer, Hood won. But at the same time, we have to notice that out of Lohs' column and even Hildesheimer's entry have been published and exhibited far more than Hood's built design ever since. So in terms of exhibition, Lohs won the competition and he won by far. If we look at exhibitions and competitions on this level as something conflated, we could also say the other way around, exhibitions are competitions. And in fact, they are. If you look at the 1925 exhibition in Paris, where Kiesler and Le Corbusier presented their designs, or at the Biennale Pavilions in Venice, where you see national and architectural competition at once at play, you actually realize that each exhibition is also a sort of competition, but in the sense architects look at competition. So, for instance, the Strada Novissima by Portuguese in Venice in the 1980s, early on, was basically a competition between 20 architects designing the best facade. And you see Hans Hollein actually borrowing from out of Lowe's uh, Chicago Tower here. And in fact, we participated in the 2017 edition of the Chicago Biennial, seen on the right, where Johnston Mark Lee invited uh, 20 architects of our generation to once again uh, design a tower for the Chicago Tribune. And exactly like in the Stade Novissima, it was the idea to actually confront architectural thought in an exhibition as if it were a competition. So competitions seem to be, for us architects, a place for debate above all. And that means that part participating in a uh, competition or in an exhibition is actually for us pretty much the same thing. When we entered, for instance, the competition for the Berlin Palace reconstruction in 2008, we did not necessarily believe in the competition's mission. What we believed in was rather something different. We wanted to influence the debate and we chose not to follow the brief, but actually opted for a different understanding of the task which is, instead of a full reconstruction, we propose the palace volume as a life-size model in a uh, brass of brick. That means a shell construction following the model of Albertis and others incomplete Renaissance buildings. A naked volume is a starting point here for another discussion about reconstruction. This, in our mind, would revitalize the urban space envisioned by Schinkel. But also, and more importantly, the built model was a way to discuss the politics of the place and the historical memory and the role of architecture in the political process. So even though we didn't win the competition, it became somehow a public discussion. And so competitions can also be game changers, and they can also be game changers uh, when they are being won, as this one that uh, we decided for ourselves in Montreal, and which we are now building, uh, the Insectarium uh, in the Botanical Garden. I think it all depends very much on how competitions are being run. And this is exemplary because the Insectarium in the Botanical Garden six years ago was a competition that actually asked for a comprehensive design integrating architecture, landscape, and museology. And we developed the project together with landscape architects at Le Balto and with GLP and Gilles de Fontenay from Montreal. What we did differently from most competitions, we actually made a comprehensive project integrating all these uh, different disciplines, which we work on in our office also separately usually, but we never uh, were able to propose together. So this competition actually made us think differently once about architecture and museology were uh, actually conflated in one competition. We looked at the floor plan in a way of figure on ground that we had never looked at this before and became for us actually a laboratory. We explored novel ways of uh, making space, changing our notions of figure on ground, but not only. We also looked at different uh, perceptual levels and we somehow integrated uh, 
a very uh, well-written brief by the uh, client into a whole new concept of making uh, space uh, appear. So, so the experience of the visitor became actually central. It became all somehow a subjective parcours. And I would say that the concept of the brief allowed us to design an almost invisible architecture, something we had been thinking about a long time before, but we had not been able to express that way. And it makes total sense uh, in relation to our museological concept, but it would not have been successful at all just as an architectural exercise uh, on its own. So the public line, Montreal's Espace pour la Vie, played an important role here because in their years-long effort, together with museologists and other entomologists of, the, of their department, they actually uh, prepared a brief that allowed for quite a specific solution by us. And I would say and argue that this sort of transdisciplinary competition with a content-driven jury on both the architectural and the political side proved to be very successful, and it will also in the future be the way forward. Uh, and it's the way that novelty can occur through a competition understood as a true laboratory. Thank you, Wilfried, for uh, un underscoring and aligning the fact that some competitions can act and, uh, as a game changer in, 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 in uh, an architect's own practice, um, maybe not so much as a disciplinary uh, level all, all the time, but certainly as a personal uh, rupture. And this idea of, uh, um, you know, the, 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 I would say the transgressive uh, dimension of some uh, competitions or some, uh, uh, you know, projects in a competition situation uh, needs to be um, uh, explored, of course. Our next uh, speaker is Benjamin Hosbar. Um, who is the co-founder of Phase Ein, uh, pro a firm of projects consultants and design competition organizers in Berlin. And if I want to test his modesty, I will add, I will add pers my personal view. I think these are probably the best, uh, or certainly some of the best competitions organizers in the world. And we are really um, happy that they actually uh, work on a major competitions for the parliamentary, parliamentary Hill he, uh, here in Ottawa. So. Please enjoy Benjamin's uh, presentation. Hi, my name is Benjamin Hosbach from Berlin and I'm pleased to be part of this symposium on innovation in and through design competitions. And here are my humble thoughts on possible answers to the six questions that were asked. What I would like to send in advance is that my statements refer to project competitions, which are organized with a clear intention of implementing the project. However, in a slightly different nuance, my comments also apply to idea competitions where the innovation has another meaning from the very beginning. Your first question, why it is necessary to stimulate innovation in architecture, is probably self-explanatory. The other five questions are much more complex, I would say. To save time, I'll go into all of them together. In terms of forms of innovation that are allowed by competitions, the first two coming into my mind are fairly obvious. The first one, the first form of innovation allowed by competitions is the innovation in design solutions. It is the very nature of the competitive pressure that enforce new solutions and design, technology, functionality, environmental friendliness, etc. However, competition itself is no guarantee for innovation. This only becomes possible when the entire process of competition is characterized by courage, honesty and trust in the knowledge of others. To encourage participants to make innovative proposals, the framework must be precisely defined. Jurors known for progressive discussions must be involved and the procedural framework must be formulated accordingly. At this, clients need support of experienced consultation by the jury and the competition management, as well as from professional association, such as chambers of architects that may oversee the competition. The second form of innovation is innovation by opening the market. Competitions create the framework to expand the circle of always the same players with new colleagues. The involvement of young designers or colleagues from other regions and countries enable a renewal among the parties involved. The other three forms I have identified are maybe less obvious than the first two. Number three, the innovation and the thinking of the general public made possible by competitions. The public's understanding and acceptance of unconventional solutions in architecture is undoubtedly 
much greater if they have been found through a design competition, to my understanding at least. The presentation of the variety of ideas exhibited with many pictures that can be understood even by the layman makes the decision comprehensible. Further, the participation of independent experts in the jury makes another relevant difference to achieve acceptance in the public. Number four, innovation through competition as a procurement method methodology. The vast majority of contracts are not organized via competitions. Even in countries where design competitions have a long tradition and where the legal frame has been defined, competitions are not always been well established as a routine in pr public procurement. Competitions are maybe seen as a luxury applied only to extraordinary projects, the concert hall, museum, parliament or the airport. Yes, these are important lighthouse projects that contribute to innovation. For me, however, it's the bulk of the projects, the schools, the kindergartens, office buildings, residential buildings, urban projects, hospitals, sport halls that are exciting. In these everyday projects, so to say, the opportunity for a quantum leap for innovation is at least as great. As a, con as a consequence, the integration of competitions into the procurement law and the application of this option on a broad scale is the door opener to achieve innovation. Finally, innovation of the competition process itself, obtaining innovative results and achieving the acceptance also requires openness to innovation, courage, diligence and honesty in the pro process themselves. This applies to the definition of the task, the selection of the partners, the organization of meetings and the methodology in the evaluation of the projects. I don't think that in the future every event in competition should be held online via video conferencing and BIM is not a universal solution in examining the proposals. But the emergency of the past months has shown that change is possible. With a willingness to, questions, to question routines, the idea of competition and its basic principles also have a future in the 21st century for international and regional projects alike. Thank you very much. Thank you, Benjamin. And I would like all the speakers uh, to invite all the speakers to uh, uh, reconnect and reopen their cameras. Thank you very much. And my first um, uh, question will be to uh, to allow Lily and Ali um, to maybe reflect on what has been presenting. But also, I would like to uh, uh, to underline an aspect that they um, raised, which I think is very important, which is this notion of an incremental um, innovation. Um, um, you know, there is a travel of idea, a voyage of ideas between projects, from projects to projects. Um, I usually tell my second year students in the theory class that if, if they invent three concepts in their entire career, they will have the, the you know, the career of Le Corbusier. Um, so I advise them to be a little bit more modest. Uh, and But I'd, I'd like you to share your views on this experience that you um, manifested today uh, of the of the way some competitions allow an opening um, in in the in a, in a kind of regular practice of architecture yes um, thank you I mean um, in terms of um, competitions you always have the opportunity to uh, let's say uh, start to uh, as a, a way of breeding ideas or breeding technologies you can you can test them uh, let's say uh, put into into into, uh, into a context. In that sense, it's a very speculative means of of, of um, I mean remaining open internally as an architect. No, I mean not always just to come up with an idea immediately that uh, kind of addresses the brief of the of the competition, but more uh, kind of uh, diagrammatically uh, uh, starting to test technologies. In that sense, it's it's quite I mean, intriguing to us to to, um, to remain quite uh, truthful to that uh, condition of architecture. So, so this, yeah, yeah. yeah. This, well, we missed a little bit of your um, of your uh, answer, but why well, did at least? But I'd like I'd like Wilfried maybe to react on the same question because the the way you um, um, tackled this issue of innovation was really through this idea, which is sometimes uh, a bit. Uh, heroic that some competitions actually uh, transgress and that uh, 
uh, you know, I don't know what Benjamin thinks of competitors who don't want to an answer the brief, but you know, we all, we always hear this uh, this fascinating experience. So, um, would you would you recognize a, a, a more uh, incremental uh, experimentation, a, a more experimental innovation, or do you believe that um, you know competitions need to break with some kind of established, um, I would say, state of uh, things in a way? Well, I think it's not so heroic after all. I think uh, years ago it was quite normal that architectural competitions asked for a contribution that would not full, fully fulfill the brief. And uh, it would be legally possible to afterwards even build that. Uh, today, for legal reasons, that's impossible. Uh, someone would always uh, sue the, the, the um, Clients. So basically, you cannot do this anymore. Competitions are much more narrow, much more narrow today than they were even 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And so basically, you have to decide for yourself if you are still willing to, to transgress the brief, because you know you will be probably then uh, out, you know, in a way. So 20 years ago, you, you, you might have won, uh, now you're out. And so the question is where are competitions going generally? In which direction are they taking? And this is a question uh, maybe about how to make competitions. We should speak with Benjamin Hosbach about this, how to actually frame them uh, politically. I, I believe, on the other hand, that uh, for an architect, it's always the choice to, to somehow find a solution within the boundaries of the brief. Uh, that's also when you work privately for a client or directly without a competition, you're tasked. But you always question the brief. While you do this, you question the brief. And you, you ask a client uh, if they really uh, thought it all the way through and you do this in a polite way, of course. So I think that um, questioning the brief and redefining the task is, is always part of the designing process. We all know this. So basically the question is how can an architecture competition integrate and somehow uh, make this part of the process? And I think, maybe, for instance, working in several phases is, is a way forward. Thank you. And, and I'd like Tina to react on this before, uh, before asking Benjamin to uh, to comment. So Tina, in your own experience of competitions and, and you have a huge experience of winning competitions, uh, did you find that you always cheat with the brief or do you uh, sometimes comply with what is being uh, um, asked for? Yeah, thank you for the question and also the previous answers. Um, yeah, I still believe that the first um, public competitions that we entered was uh, 25 years ago and we completely contradicted the brief as young architects and actually uh, getting a prize for contradicting the brief gave us the courage for our new competitions to come in the last 25 years. So I think this kind of uh, the power that still exists as we were told in the last week um, discussion uh, in Switzerland, this is still possible. What, what Wilfried, you mentioned um, that it's not possible anymore in Europe because they have a legal um, somehow disclosure that in certain competitions uh, contradicting the brief is still a legal way to winning it. Um, so we see, even though we have all these experiences, that the way you design the procedure of the competition is crucial in order to see how much of the critical thinking um, you could incorporate. And I do agree through the um, recent or last uh, 10 years of experiences in two stage competitions that they were the possible formats in which we could contribute to the refinement of the brief to rethink the, the question at hand and actually through the two stages we could be, we were able to influence um, the, the result, the winning result that was not anticipated before. Uh, because the discussion that you have the opportunity to, to start to formulate with, within going to the next stage, it's the only discussion you might have with the client or the one who organizes the competition. Um, but Tina, the, the first competition you won, if I'm not mistaken, was a European competition. Yeah, you're mistaken. Uh, we actually lost uh, a European competition. The first competition I won was uh, a student competition when I was in second year. But the first competition as a practice was a huge housing, social housing competition here in Slovenia. But the thing is that we were working on international and local competitions from the scratch. And I think winning 
um, massive competition, like really large international competition, which was my first student competition, where more than thousand proposal came in. That was also another courage that um, where we went with the radical way and we were able to somehow um, win one of the 10 prizes. So I think in this is really a refinement, but what I could see, of course, I think it's really important to note it down how young the architects were when they proposed either Parc de la Villette or Sydney Opera or um, Centre Pompidou or similar, is that you see, and of course we've seen that also through the um, your last competition of your Yokohama Master Plan by OMA or the one competition of Yokohama Terminal by uh, FOA. So you've seen that, of course, the importance of the jury and, of course, the boldness that you are willing to take at the beginning of your career. Because at the beginning of your career, you, I think, mostly, even six years ago or today, you want to state something and you have nothing to lose. And, of course, it's up to the established practices to be continuously uh, on the edge, to be able to contradict to a competition after 20 or 30 years of practice. It's a different challenge when you, when you open up the practice. Um, and I think this should be a, a perpetual question to, to ask for. Thank you. So Benjamin, what is your take on this? How do you convince public and private clients to uh, to open a competitions for experimentation and innovation. Unmute, sorry. Uh, a good question. And uh, first of all, um, I think it's important uh, that the management or the, the preparation of the competition is understood as the first stage of the planning process. Uh, and that uh, we believe that our work or the work of competition organizers is an architectural work. So when you say that we are convincing uh, the client or we, we at least we're challenging, uh, challenging them uh, to um, find out uh, about their own um, uh, framework, uh, this is our contribution um, uh, where we are limited for sure uh, because we are not designing. So um, it always needs a second part of the process, which is uh, the actual de uh, design competition to convince a client how brave he or she is, because the pictures, they make a difference, a big difference. Um, so in that sense, there is not one answer. Yes, for sure. Uh, it is our job to, to, to find out and to challenge. And uh, sometimes the clients are not as brave, at least in the beginning. Uh, maybe the, the, their braveness develops um, in the competition itself. In other cases, uh, it never appears, uh, but that's also reality. And uh, that is uh, for sure the, the danger of competitors to, to enter then with very um, courageous uh, contributions. Um, I, I have to correct uh, Wilfried's um, statement uh, at least a little bit and, and I can um, uh, maybe help you that it is not as bad in, uh, in our legal frame that um, there's no way um, uh, to, to give a commission when you break rules. The question is how we define the rules. And there is this little thing in our rules as well, which allows to allow um, the break of rules, which is the binding conditions. Thank you. Uh, Bechara, uh, I mean, it seems that we're only always talking about the Lavillette competitions, about Chumi, about OMA. Um, you know, it seems that we are clearly lacking um, serious studies on, on what really happens in competitions, although, you know, we have been trying to do our best, but the, we always come back to these examples. And that yet, architect seems to be convinced, and you, re you referred to Lipstadt's uh, first um, comprehensive books on competitions, the experimental tradition. So architect seems to be convinced that competitions are the place um, to open an experimental uh, space in their own practice. So, you know, why is it that we always refer to the same competitions? Well, I think maybe that this competition specifically comes out as a as a unique uh, situation. Uh, it's not something that happens all the time. And maybe that's the problem, the fact that we don't see this as often as we would like uh, this to happen. Uh, I would remind you that in 1976, there was another La Villette competition 
and there was an idea competition. So technically, you would think this would have been more open and more um, uh, experimental in a way. It would have like uh, called for more open, uh, innovative projects, and it wasn't the case at all. Uh, what happened is 1982 was really the moment when when things happened uh, with Chumi and and Kulas, and I don't think it's it's because. Um, uh, I think the experimentation kind of happened before also. Uh, both these architects uh, arrived on the stage with those in that competition, having worked for several years on experimental projects. So it was more of a state of mind, a state of doing things. And it was the, their first uh, um, opportunity to, to make it shine uh, on a public stage somehow, not in a book or a publication, but really through an actual project. And uh, a lot of things happened. I think the fact that the, the brief was, was uh, called for a model, the fact that a brief was, uh, the, the program itself was very, very hard to work out on the site. Uh, the, the way the jury was set up, everything came together uh, for, for basically those, those proposals to, to, to be embraced and, and, uh, and awarded somehow. Um, but it wasn't, um, all the proposals of the competition that were experimental, those are the, the, the most experimental ones. So it's okay, not so a general now, thing. Thank you. Let's reach a you know, collective um, question that I'd like to raise and, and you'll, you'll raise your hand if you want to, to start first. It's, it's this kind of tension between young architects on one side. And as I told you, um, Stanley and I collected a series of figures um, that actually proved that, you know, a, a great deal of important competitions and international competitions have been won by young architects without the world falling apart after that. So, you know, there is something here. At the same time, young architects complain more and more that it's more and more difficult to, for them to actually, you know, uh, enter the world of competitions, mainly because of this idea now that, uh, you know, everything has to be uh, dealt on the background of risk management. So, you know, on the one side, young architects as, a, as pushing for new ideas, but being um, sometimes repressed in a way. And on the other, this idea that Wilfried actually uh, uh, underlined that, uh, that somehow more and more competitions are kind of entangled, are kind of uh, stuck um, uh, between a, a very constraining framework. So, um, you know, do you have any uh, particular advice or do you particular experience? Uh, uh, you know, I, we all want our young architects to be, uh, um, um, uh, you know, welcome in competitions. But in Canada, for example, it's very, very difficult if you haven't designed a library before to enter a single tiny competition for a library. So who, who would like to, to, um, to contribute to this uh, uh, open reflection? Benjamin, maybe? Yes. Yeah, well, maybe. Uh, well, maybe it's, it's uh, even though it's sad, it's also uh, a mirror of our society in general or of uh, the generation of architects. Um, if I look at uh, the Lafarge Holtem Awards, which we are organizing since many years, and each time we are receiving hundreds of projects, and there is uh, um, one part of the award is for professionals and the other one is for students. And the students is definitely uh, precisely designed uh, that um, uh, innovative proposals are submitted. It's each time almost that the jury is kind of frustrated that the young ones, they're presenting really um, feasible and, and doable projects that they have developed in their schools, where it's more the, the, the older or the professional ones who use this platform uh, to finally come out with something uh, that is a bit uh, out of uh, the, the the normal, so um, uh, I mean that's that's quite a bad scenario. I must uh, admit, um, but it's uh, but it's somehow real. Uh, and um, uh, and probably the last years, like Wilfried uh, mentioned, um, at least in our part of the world, have been frightening uh, or um, um, making um, uh, the colleagues uh, careful um, that they're not as risky anymore. Um, that in, in the seldom cases where there is a bit of, an, uh, of a niche for innovation or for young people, uh, they don't, don't even step in. 
But shouldn't we distinguish between, you know, the openness of competitions on one side to, uh, yeah. you know, for simple reasons of fairness and equity and everything and inclusion, of course. And, and as you said, uh, you know, the, the, the innovative dimensions of some competitions, maybe not all competitions are made to innovate, you know, in, in the sense, in the, in the strong sense of the world. And that's, that's why I like, uh, I liked uh, Lily and Ali's presentation. You know, there is a space for incremental um, uh, thinking within uh, um, almost any uh, project situation. So um, shouldn't we distinguish? Lily, would you like? Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. I think also to, to agree with Benjamin, um, I think age and young is not necessarily something that will automatically make you innovative and, and experimental. But um, yes, uh, I, we, we, we don't really, I mean, we haven't really ever chosen a brief or a competition that is so, let's simply put it simply bad that we that we feel we should just completely um, 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 overturn it and, and prove that the, the clients want, want something completely crazy. We really try to go for briefs that are in themselves innovative. And there, thank God, recently there have been enough around for us to be able to test the things we like to test. And um, like the first, um, the, as Adi was talking in, in the video, the we've been doing a lot of um, educational spaces, competitions. And since the, there's a lot of, like going on in, with pedagogy right now and people and teachers and, and are learning people that have to do with learning spaces have a lot of ideas of how it should be done, but have no um, view, no, no visions of how these spaces actually should look like. This really was something that we completely uh, in, embraced as, as something where we can go in and show, you know, just tr test things and show um, spaces that they hadn't even thought of because it's something that is very new for the, the users and, and, and the people involved. And the first um, uh, Bildungs Campus project in the Sonnenfeldviertel was like that. They, they really didn't have the typical kind of space lists with the square meters and then blah, blah, blah. But they really just kind of described how these spaces should look and what should happen and even how they should feel and how it should be. And that for us was just an, an amazing approach for the client to actually put a competition out there. And the results, I think the first Beatles Compass competition, it had like 120 entries. And most of the people, young and old, had very conservative um, answers to, to this project because they had everybody has was already so um, caught up in what what people think a classroom or whatever should look like that they didn't even try new things and so we 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 were quite lucky and in, in actually actually listening to what they wanted and actually giving them what they wanted and winning that first school competition so for for us as back then maybe we were younger I don't know but that was really our first way to go to come into this this world of, of, of competitions that um, you yeah it's true you need references now to be able to do a competition so that was really our first step to to join in these be in these competitions. Thank you, Wilfried. You want to uh, enter? The I just think it, it it makes sense that you would actually win a competition where the client uh, is so open and. Uh, also so transparent about not knowing yet the result or not even the real program, but rather exposing an idea. That was the case also in the insectarium, I would say. In, in sectarium I showed because it was a competition where the client was at the same time very prepared. They, were, they worked three or four years on preparing this competition. At the same time, they had absolutely no clue how it would look like. And so I think this was quite spectacular to participate in a competition, take part in a challenge where you you would actually have someone who is very prepared but at the same time uh, very open and of course that's an ideal circumstance and pedagogy which is also behind the insectarium because it's mostly a space for, for children and families uh, and it's educational in, in many ways I think uh, allows for more experimentation in that sense and so for us it was a laboratory because we changed our whole idea of what architecture could be through this competition um, I, I think at the same time, that's not the usual 90%. It's not like that. You know, we have to be honest about this. Competitions mostly are more pragmatic 
And that's also okay because they have an economical aim and they have a political aim and they are clients that are less uh, interested uh, in, in themes and, and pedagogy and things like that. So we have to also find solution for that part. Uh, it wouldn't be enough to just be experimental uh, when it comes to museums and schools. I think we we would need a, a more, you know, more a larger somehow attitude in that sense. And, and that's something to be researched. But again, I would say it would be very interesting if competitions generally were in phases or, or stages and not just one off. Because I think that really the the the, the, the also the possibility of reformulating a brief un, under the impression of the first stage would really be something very uh, great, you know, if that, that were possible. So Tina, I'd like your view on this before uh, I ask Thomas to maybe, uh, um, uh, de, you know, offer a new angle for, uh, for uh, shaping the discussion, Tina, on... on, on uh, um, it was great to listen to the discussion because it seems that, you know, if you embed this kind of great challenge and high-end ambition and the openness, and, but uh, within the precise brief, then you may kind of frame the ground for some sort of innovation and laboratories. And this is actually very similar um, um, as comparing the La Villette to the project that you just mentioned in Sectorium of uh, So basically you see that, um, and of course, if we read today the brief of La Villette, you can hear the ambition going out of the brief. But of course, as mentioned before, uh, you always get, uh, it's about the ambition of the jury that will select the experimental project. Uh, or not. So, you know, if you invite uh, Rinzo Piano or Isozaki and Burle Marx, already with that said, you define that this is going to be an open and experimental competition. So I think, um, as we all agree, I think that the preparation of the competition is crucial to define where it might lead to, and it should be the first part of the design process. We should never underestimate that the decision to take part is the openness or the precision of the brief. And also what we discussed last week was also that the briefs could be written in the way to define the question as the question was to define the model for the urban park of 21st century. So a model for something that we are not aware of, a new typology that would challenge the status quo. And if this question is embedded then also the answers might be more radical, but still within sort of scale definition or within the, the, the kind of the parameters of the site itself. So I think the challenges didn't change so much, but of course, when you really read these historical briefs, you are aware that only with this kind of ambition that you go in, you might expect something on that level of the game changer in our profession. I guess maybe um, we should be careful also because, you know, the La Villette competitions were open competitions, you know, hundreds of people in the world sent projects. Uh, and like Brescia said, you know, there were a series of La Villette competitions, not, not just one. And, you know, compared to the very fine competition, thank you for your compliments, Wilfried. But, uh, you know, the, the, I followed closely the, the competitions for the Insectarium and the Biodome and so on. They were well organized, but you, you you can never compare this kind of competitions with with the La Villette. You know, they, these are different. So, Thomas, um, would you like to uh, inject some new? You know, I just want to remind you guys that he is writing a PhD thesis on all this. So, whatever you say will be injected in his thesis. Written down. <laughs> um, I, I pose my next question or the next, let's say, subfield around a, a question already. Uh, Came, that came to me via, via YouTube, um, but I'll kind of a little bit rephrase it. Um, I think now we prepared the brief, no? we, we read the brief, we almost uh, did the project. And um, the question is, or let's say the frame around the question is, I think that innovation is a definition. No? It's about the invention or idea plus the commercialization. In our field, we could say communication of an idea to society, to our knowledge uh, databases. And uh, innovation, the second step is called diffusion. So uh, how can we make things attractive to others? How can we convince others 
of a certain rather better way to do things and eventually buy it or use it. No, and of course, in, in architecture, it might be a little bit more complicated because the jury is just an intermediary market, one could say. But Bechara was 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 talking about the the entry as a model, no? and I found this very very interesting. So a thing that leaves also some space open uh, for a jury member to take, to make it their own project. No? There's also a quote of, of Ram, I think one year after losing the lead, where he said that um, because of their addiction to architecture, so they couldn't stop designing. No? They forgot about the basic principle of competitions, um, at least to his uh, view that it's about being understandable in the end. No? So you have to be understandable. They thought they were too final, too precise, too specific with their contribution. So my question would be, what is the project in a competition? No? Is it a model, a prototype? And, and, and what should it not be? Um, probably also for, I think it's for the whole round, of course. Um, um, yeah, maybe for Benjamin as, as a first. Benjamin and Bishar, I think. Um, uh, oh, um, well, for the layman in the jury, the client representatives, um, but even uh, the architects and the jury. Uh, Benjamin, we are losing you, I that, think. Yeah? Yeah, a little bit. You're losing me? <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> oh. Figuratively speaking, maybe Bishara in a minute while you kind of fix this. Okay. Bishara. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. Bishara, okay. you want yeah, to? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Um, how do, uh, the question was about how do you convince the jury? How do you communicate your idea? It's it's really hard to say. Uh, uh, what I find, I, we're, we're so always talking about you know the Lavillette one, uh, the Lavillette competition because it's really interesting at this point, but. Um, if you read the uh, the text that was produced by uh, by Coolhouse for the um, for the competition, it's really a model. It's really like a step by step uh, explanation of how do you, how you design an urban park. And Chumi does exactly the same thing. Those diagrams, as we've seen, you know, over and over again, where you you really have the different steps and. Um, in how he gets to the, the solution. And th those are almost like algorithms of, of how to design architecture for the future. Um, I mean, in, in those cases, and again, we're talking about a very, very specific case because, I mean, uh, we should never forget that this was part of the Mitterrand projects. Uh, there were like uh, about, a, about 10 of them, I believe. And, and their, their very obvious goal was to really uh, put out uh, monuments out there that will shape, you know, the the, the landscape to come. Uh, so, so it is a competition that asked for a prototype, a new way of doing things, and especially something that really will, uh, you know, marquer les esprits, something that will, you know, uh, strike strike the way people see architecture and they will remain in the images and you can think of uh, of, of, the, of the Mitterrand era today without thinking about you know la défense and all those big projects they really changed completely paris there it's not the same before and after um, so they are prototypes and at the same time they become models that can be used and that's what i really like about it when you when you really look at these and 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 we teach them uh, i teach them in the the courses i give um, you, you take the, uh, the algorithm that Rem Kulas came up with for the urban park and becomes an algorithm that works for designing a house. It doesn't have to be an urban park anymore. It's just a way of thinking about architecture. Um, so it's more, it's not a recipe, it's, it's, it's a model. It really is a model. Sometimes you will have some exceptional projects like this. It's not always the case, obviously. But how do you get now, them? Now that you've quit the gym and you're back in the library, can we... Uh... Yeah, obviously the connection is better here. Uh, I hope the music in the back is not too bad. Um, uh, well, the point about La Villette is uh, maybe that's really too much of an exception and uh, um, a really lucky coincidence that there has been big power coming from the back, supporting it and encouraging jurors and everybody. And then by coincidence, 
coincidence it was the right time uh, of some architects appearing uh, and uh, the question is how can we um, uh, develop such um, chances uh, in, in, in more projects and other projects uh, and, and, and really squeezing out what is possible uh, another example that I like, um, maybe to quote by coincidence, it's also a great architect that Zaha won the competition for the BMW Central Building in Leipzig, uh, a project of her which is not as often published. But uh, for me, it's uh, quite groundbreaking because the client, at least some parts of the client side, were very open and uh, formulating a brief that was uh, about rethinking the workspace in factory. Oh. Being convinced, uh, which needed a lot of uh, very pragmatic arguments. And at the end, when um, uh, I was lucky to pick up Zaha at the airport and drive her to, uh, to Leipzig, she was quite surprised that I told her that she won the competition because it was the most functional project, uh, uh, what we could prove to the client. So that was another lucky coincidence, more or less, that an uh, extreme... Oh, I'm afraid uh, I can maybe that ma uh, made a change. Uh -huh, okay, yeah. I can maybe we we lost you a little bit, Benjamin. I can yeah. just kind of add a very funny story. I was actually working. The only time that I actually worked in at Zaha was for one month after postgraduate at DAA, working for exactly that competition in the second stage. So I vividly remember how we were pre preparing. Uh, the answer for that, but I can also share another uh, particular detail that actually at the second stage competition we submitted and obviously it was functional, I, I remember because I was working on the first, uh, first floor, but we submitted the competition without the structure and that was really intriguing for me as a young architect, how can you actually submit a competition without structure, so that is Zaha Hadid um, competition. You. Well, it took quite a brave uh, examination team uh, to convince the client that uh, the building would hold without structure. Um, uh, and by the way, this detail, your, your model did not hold. Hmm. But what I uh, uh, Wilfried, uh, I think you mentioned that uh, the staging of procedures is uh, is crucial. Uh, the, it's a learning process, and uh, the dialogue within the uh, the competition is extremely important. And uh, even in the tough thing, uh, where uh, even uh, colloquia with participants are. Uh, extremely restricted. Um, you can, you need to squeeze uh, the client uh, to to open his heart uh, or his attitude. Uh, only then you can. Yeah, Benjamin, we are losing you again. I'm afraid. Maybe Wilfred, would you did you pick up on? He was hinting at uh, your own practice. Well, right now we are participating in the in a competition where we actually make the experience and we, it's the first time we do a competition like this where the staging happens in such a way that the intermediate presentations are in front of everyone also the competitors so that everyone actually sees what you are doing and you can steal from each other freely because basically it's all out there that's a new experience and i like it very much because it takes away this uh, this idea of um, somehow running against uh, one another purely. It's more like a big laboratory in which you uh, develop, uh, try to develop ideas together. And uh, you have to, of course, respect those who are your rivals in that sense. And you have to have trust in the, in the uh, procedure, but it is fun. Uh, and uh, for me, that's much more the idea that is also similar to what I said in my brief talk uh, about the exhibition. Uh, in an exhibition, you're always competitive but you're not competitive to, to uh, eliminate the others, but to somehow play with the others and to uh, engage with the others and to discuss with the others. And you want to make an argument and you want to somehow sharpen your, your discourse and your debate. 
And in that sense, a competition that is actually staged uh, maybe even over three stages and, and happens openly. Um, and that should be well paid, I, I, I believe, because everyone should somehow commit as much as possible without uh, having only in mind to, to win. So it's, it's like an idea finding process for everyone. I find a very good way forward. Uh, and it means, I think that also competitions are changing quite a bit in this sense now, because uh, also cities, clients, and uh, people doing these competitions and preparing them, like Benjamin, uh, are well aware of this uh, advantage. Uh, Lily and Ali, there is one aspect uh, that I've observed uh, in some competitions, uh, which, and I would like to see if, uh, if, if you check if it uh, echoes your own practice. It's, I would call it the didactic um, dimension or didactic element. You know, we've been talking about innovating in the interpretation of the brief, uh, in typologies like you showed, but, um, but there is a, a specific challenge in any competition to actually explain your ideas because you know that the client or the jury is going to be bombarded with ideas, so you want to be sure that you know you're going to go through and and so on. So, uh, do you also use competitions as a way to uh, refine, improve, transform your own way of presenting, and what I would call the didactic dimension, or or um, you know, or else? <laughs> yeah, I mean it's very complicated. It's like uh, as as Winfried said, is a is a one man. Uh, so the competition news in terms of able to communicate. Your, your sound is really slow. Uh, I don't know if it's me, uh, Thomas. Do you? I don't hear it well either. Okay. Oh, okay. Maybe you can go closer to the mic. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, 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 as as Wilfried said, it's it's, 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 it's it's a very um, let's say um, isolated kind of work. You don't uh, see your rivals. You always have the feeling of uh, you're you're all alone. Have to uh, compete. And so your, 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 your method of presenting your own work or kind of selling your own kind of experiment is a very weird uh, situation you get, you get caught in as, as an architect. Um, I mean, we, we try to work on the idea of how to show our work, but I guess we're not that good at it. I mean, we... <laughs> what would you say, Lee? Hmm? Um, well, that's fine. <laughs> It's a difficult, difficult, uh, I mean, challenge in terms of not ending up only as a seller of an own project, be able to decide precisely kind of um, ending up uh, in terms of um, articulating your project. I mean, there's that different ways of um, uh, dealing uh, with projects. We try to be more specific about the articulation of the project and maybe sometimes too much precise. Much leaving the team, too, too often, but leaving the client with a space of uh, expectation. But we think, as, uh, as architects, it's also important to uh, be more specific about how you are the project. Mm -hmm. Maybe sometimes it's too, too, too much. No, no, I mean, part of what you said, Lily, would you like to maybe comment on your own? Uh... No, I mean, uh, we, we, of course, we, we, it's, it's also something we, we love to do and we experiment with in the, the different ways of presenting our work from trying different things with texts also maybe more or like sort of short texts of how users are experiencing the, 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 the spaces we, we, we project and, and so on. But um, I'm also quite interested in what Wilfried said about this new type of competition, which I've never heard of. I'm very curious to, to, to hear more about this. I hope that the, the, there'll be more of them around because it is a very lonely situation. And I think if you, um, this kind of, you, you do unless you really are sort of a kamikaze architect, you do tend to, um, you start strategizing when you get briefs, you start compromising and you, 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 do, you do more of a strategy of how can I possibly win something then and we try not to. We try not to, and we and that's why we don't win a lot, obviously. But um, um, so I think this idea, and then really, it's all these these all these uh, projects handed in by thousands of architects, and then really the discussion and the uh, starts as after it starts with the jury or with the architectural theorists and journalists who then they get to discuss our projects. We're just sort of the, the canon and footer for them, and they get to talk about this. So I think it's a wonderful idea to have to have the opportunity in uh, in a competition to talk about stuff before. So then you you have an idea of how far you can go, 
and what directions you can go and to, and to actually think about things uh, and not risk all the time and then just, you know, be tossed out in the first round, you know. So do we uh, go from one competition to another? I mean, you, you uh, uh, Ali mentioned this idea of a cumul cumulative intelligence, but it's an open question now. Um, you know, if we are serious about uh, experimentation, innovation, shouldn't we be more careful with the thousands of projects we produce? Um, so, and Bishar mentioned this, this connection, what he observed in uh, real laboratories where the, the, I would say the documentation of experimentation is as crucial as the, uh, you know, protocol itself. You know, you have to be able to not so much reproduce in our case in architecture, but definitely understand what we've been doing. Um, would you, uh, would you share your experience of, you, you know, uh, I'm, I'm talking to Tina, Wilfred, uh, Ali, Lili, um, mainly, I guess, but I know that Benjamin, for example, very often, and he's very, his firm is very well known for that. They actually compare the project. They have a very strict comp analytical comparative, uh, um, um, I would say, framework. Um, do you do this with your own projects or it's, you know, you don't have time and it's one project after the other? I would like to, uh, to be honest on documentation. <laughs> No, I can say something. We we uh, we do um, look back at our at our projects, the ones we lost, and of course, every one of us loses many more competitions than than we win and uh, than we built, especially because even winning doesn't mean that you realize it afterwards. So basically, there's a lot of material there, you know, and and it's also uh, interesting to look back because you you are. Uh, you try to understand why would the jury not even read your thought? You know, you, as, as Lily says, first round, you just, you, you know, you're out immediately and you, you know that you have worked on this maybe three months with a team of five um, and you are out immediately. So without even, when you're out immediately, it means you don't even get a comment from the jury. So you don't even know why. And, uh, and this is uh, quite interesting because then you, you really have to look at the projects very well that won at the projects that, that lost at your project try to understand the context. And this is not about understanding only what you did wrong tactically or strategically. It is rather um, to understand if you maybe misread the brief or if you have maybe certain preconceptions that don't work or if you are somehow in, in the wrong kind of frame, you know, and you, you want to understand your, your practice and what you're doing and why you're doing it. And sometimes you, you conclude that you you misread or that you actually forgot something or you, you somehow misunderstood a certain importance of something. And some other times you really believe in your project even after the, the one that, that one has been built. As for instance, for me, it's the case with the, with the Humboldt Forum, which is now being built. And I still believe our project would have been so much better for the city. But at the, at the same time, there we were somehow the moral winners and we couldn't, could, couldn't even complain. You know, In other cases, it is rather that you really feel so lost because you, 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 you lose and you don't get even an answer why. And that is really, that feels really, can feel terrible, you know, I find. Indeed, yeah. Um, Tina, yes. Yeah, I think it's uh, really important to do um, also the competitions in your own city, because also it happens to us that we walk around Ljubljana and we see executed things and we still visualize our own projects when we were kicked out in the first round or we just got some sort of honorable mention because it was too radical. So I think this also gives you a very, an important aspect that we haven't discussed, but I think it's really crucial that, you know, being part of certain culture and also certain environment gives you the depths of that. And sometimes this knowing of all these layers and then and, and like this ground wish that you would contribute to the environment in which you reside uh, becomes so much bigger frustration than if you lose a competition uh, far away. I, I think that's, that's really crucial. But yes, I think we should be always um, self-reflective and critical. Um, as mentioned just now by Wilfried, because I think only then we can really see when we were strategizing in order to, to, you know, to fulfill the norms and the standards, which they are overwhelming sometimes and need to be challenged, or when it was really experimental. But I think exactly this 
um, you know, the ratio between one and the other is when you are lucky to win or not. And of course, but I, I, I need to somehow reintroduce this idea, which I believe in the importance of the jury members, because only extremely strong jury members are able to not to just select a mediocre project that fulfills all, all the standards and all the green dots, which is defined with this, this rigorous structure of the competition. And only then when you have a jury member or when we are jury members, because we can be on either side, that we can fight for a project that goes beyond the me mediocrity that actually fulfills the standards, then you can have a little bit of the innovation or lab approach that we are today discussing about. And this, um, even though you don't want to discuss the um, La Villette competition or this kind of really markers in the history of, of competitions, it's always you seen that they've been personalities, that they were able to somehow argue for those fundamental projects throughout. And this is the case also in the 21st century, not only in the 20th century, I guess. Okay, so we we'll, yeah, Vishal. Yeah, maybe on the question of of, of um, going from one competition to another, I, I think also that there's the fact that even if you don't you participate in a competition, there's there's research that's been done on a project, obviously, and even if you don't win it, then whatever you gain from this research goes on into uh, your experience as an architect, and you basically go into another iteration in another competition eventually or another project. I'm thinking again about uh, Cool House, but not the uh, the Parc de la Villette, but the, uh, the, pr the private house that became the Casa de Musica, you know, like how an idea would like travel from one project to another to eventually become uh, materialized into, into, into an erected building. Um, I've heard architects telling me about, you know, working on on supermarkets and then the supermarkets would have not happened but a museum would come out of them you know the, of the the way they started working on a new way of designing form and uh, etc so so i think just by 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 doing a competition there's a there's a space of research within the competition that can maybe bring about a new way of thinking a new personal way of thinking that's not disciplinary but really like uh, proper to the person um there's maybe one thing about this iteration that's really interesting that, that might be just want to put out there. Uh, and that's something that's, that's been told uh, to me about professional architects who've been doing a lot of competitions. Um, the problem that I might have with the competitions is that I don't have the space of negotiation that I could have with a client, where there's a back and forth of, you know, you talk to the client, you convince him, he comes back with other information, and then you, you kind of work together on the project. In the case of the competition, it's really a, you work on your own, it's a very personal space, uh, and then you propose something and it's a yes or no. And, and that's pretty much it. So, so the negotiation um, is something that, you know, the, the way Wilfried was talking about, the way like architects could be working together, it becomes something else at this point. Yeah, I still think that this issue of accumulating is something, uh, you know, archiving is yeah. something very important to, for innovation and experimentation to make sense. So Benjamin, I um, uh, hope your mic is better now, but uh, uh, you know, as, a, as, as one of the most important, um, you know, competition organizers, you must have accumulating, accumulated a um, huge uh, amount of material in a way. So, I mean, do you know of any practices or firms who are very systematic in that, in that uh, realm? Or, and what, what do you do with the material you yourself accumulate, actually? Well, I hope you can hear me. Um... Uh, well, yes. we actually, we, we uh, produce three books that are full of images. Um, I could tell a lot about the history of the books, but uh, still they are only showing a little glimpse. Uh, they are, I think together they are more than 1000 pages uh, with zillions of pictures and you're completely right. Yes, we are on the lucky side that we have all of them. Uh, asking about colleagues, well, we don't know in detail. I mean, for sure we are in uh, I do know that there is uh, quite a lot of professional teams who are, like Wilfried mentioned, uh, uh, doing a recap after projects and they have their own um, 
archives, etc. So the, the world of architects is very professional, I would say, in general, in this regard. I mean, there's also a lot of innocent ones and then and, and who just uh, go ahead and then kind of fresh. But uh, in, I would say it's a lot of archiving and then looking back and learning. So we are reaching the last, I would say, 12 minutes, maybe 15. I don't know, Tina. Um, so it's, you know, let's go, let's go towards some kind of um, conclusion. Um, there are, you know, a few issues that definitely we haven't um, addressed. Uh, any suggestion from your side on, on views on, on innovation? I, I know, Wilfried, that uh, at one stage you mentioned uh, exhibitions, for example, as, as almost the, uh, the other side of competition. But, you know, is an exhibition really uh, comparable to, um, to a competition? I, th there are, you know, a series of uh, subjects that we could actually um, add to this discussion on, on innovation. Who, who would like to uh, complement? You know, it's a free, uh, free pot now. Thomas? Well, I would be still talking about the archive or extending that, 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 uh, that discussion. I think the archive opens, of course, also questions of, 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 of authority, no? of who owns the, the content. No? I think that's quite interesting also in terms of innovation per se. So I think the twin sibling of innovation is, of course, uh, imitation. So that might occur. Maybe it, it occurs anyway. No? So have to have imitation through competitions because things are public. But I wonder if a kind of collective idea of an archive opens up of also disciplinary problems of, of autonomy, of, of, of ownership of ideas. I think, Wilfried, you said that you, for you it's okay to open up, huh? to, to exchange, but um, what about the others? What about you, uh, Ali and Lily, about this idea of having a collective uh, body of knowledge? Yeah, I mean, it is, it is, it is important to, to end up uh, having a collective, collective contribution. I mean, you do take part in competitions. It's not that you uh, make a part of your own. I mean, it's- Ali, Ali, can I ask you to uh, maybe go on the side of Lily? For some reason, when Lily speaks, yeah. it works very well. Okay. <laughs> yeah, right. good. I'm saying that, uh, I mean, it, it is, uh, you do take part in competitions. In that sense, it is a part of a, open discussion and you put your work outside and it's, it's part of the open and uh, the public realm as part of an um, architectural, uh, let's say, um, discussion or exhibition. In that sense, I mean, it's, it would be interesting to, to have uh, different ways of experimenting with the idea of um, presenting or, or, or articulating projects. I don't think it's, it's so important just to end up, uh, it's my project was the first one to have that idea. Um, but as Wilfried, uh, I mean, mentioned, it's much more interesting also to to be able to um, to put the project in use in terms of also to um, to collaborate on it in terms of a, of a, of a collective contribution, not just a, a studio's uh, work. Yeah. yeah, we need Lily back in the in the picture. <laughs> any any compliment, Lily, on this? No, I no, I agree. I think it's something that. It, it, you know, it's it's interesting. It's always interesting for all of us to, you know, as soon as the the, the results are out, to, to to study each other's projects. And I think it's absolutely fine, and it should be something that we share, and that we, you know, work and and grow on and and use. And yeah. Tina. Yeah, I'm also a big fan of open knowledge and open source. So I I think that whenever you are contributing to an open competition or even invited, and if this is published, this is up to someone to, to somehow sample and, and work with that in the, in the future. I think we are far beyond this discussion. Um, therefore, I think the, the, you know, the really the questions are the fundamental. So what I was thinking today, which I really uh, enjoyed on, on that, I don't know if um, was precisely that the, all the competitions were mentioned in our discussion, that they were looking for the new models of something, the new models of working and production, as in the case of uh, Zaha Hadid, 
or the new models of pedagogy as in the, in the case of PSLA or the new models of uh, museology slash pedagogy and or the new models of the urban park. So I think um, if we would wish, of course, there are other parts of the architecture competitions, that pragmatic one uh, that it's not questioning the new models or the new typologies as something that we don't even know. But we have to fight that certain amount of the competitions, not only the biggest and the most important political statements within the capitals of any country, are the questioning of the status quo of certain typologies and certain spatial needs of certain community. And only through those questions, we could then also benefit this open archive and open sharing with the new models, with the new prototypes, not only with something that is just standard. And we, of course, know that um, the, the norms that they are binding us, either in the school buildings, uh, the fire norms, or any other norms in terms of spatial requirements or in the social housing, these are the issues that should be also questioned by some competitions. Because the, the, the stupidity of those norms, it's excel, you know, it's escalating in the last 10 years. So those who don't know how to really treat them or how to just embrace them and, and, and submit the mediocre project um, are really um, out of the league. So I think this over standardizing, over regulating, those things should be open for the discussion and open for questions. So this would be my, um, I think, I would like to challenge that within the um, our, um, institutions that they are producing the competitions um, in the future and today. Well, that's, that's a call for Benjamin. Well, I thought this was already good closing words. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Still have yeah, five, six minutes. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, again, uh, uh, we have to challenge each project. What is um, uh, suitable? What is possible? Um, and uh, how open-minded are the clients? Because otherwise, uh, it's also, um, uh, I mean, not waste of energy of the colleagues. Because, um, as you say, uh, these ideas they still go into their archives. Uh, in, in the archives of all our minds, but um, um, to trigger um, whoever is contributing to projects, that's, that's the only way to get forward and to um, increase the uh, possibilities for dialogue. It's, it's another point because only then we can learn and, and really understand. And uh, I mean, one point, what is maybe my uh, final conclusion, a, a subject that um, uh, is missing or is uh, uh, is important to me um, is uh, we are, um, we can reach innovation by um, uh, looking beyond the borders um, of our professions and uh, of our nations and uh, I mean just that we are sitting here together um, is an example that uh, competitions are bringing people together from different places and uh, different backgrounds so innovation strongly and and, uh, and uh, it was a big joy to talk to you guys and uh, i know that we'll meet again to work on this subject <laughs> yes for sure so thomas first of all you, have... you. <laughs> yes would you have a kind of a concluding comment you and tina i guess i try yeah yeah i i, I mean i think that it's really essential for innovation to emerge that there is an ambition in the beginning. Without that, it's, it's completely impossible. And I think what Benjamin said in his introduction that this kind of honesty, you know, I think you should, um, you should not ask for things you don't really want. So don't pretend you're innovative. I think that is a big trap and you should never you know, lay out this trap. I think being honest about what you want, what your aim is, what your project is about, that triggers the right degree of, of innovation, I think, no? without misunderstanding. So competitions should be missions, I, I would call them. No? A mission, and the mission has also a clear, in a way, clear target, a no? clear question, at least. So this question should, should of course, provo provoke individual ambition. The process should have at least some loopholes for individual ambition that criticizes the process itself. And, um, 
Yeah, and we have to agree, simply put, in the basic principles of innovation so that we don't know it in the beginning, what might happen. Now that is, of course, risk equals risk. But I'm 100% uh, convinced that uh, risk avoiding is also extremely risky. So um, yeah, I think the tools are, are, there, are all there. And within the procedures we have, maybe we should refine a little. But I think we just have to use them right in a way. No? Yeah. Tina, you want to? Um... I think I already expanded my closing words before, so I would like to call Wilfried, Bessara, and Lili for some comments. Any uh, final comments before I... No, I, I just would like to add that the competition uh, endows the project and the, and the architect with an incredible authority once you won a project. Um, that is also something we shouldn't forget, the legitimacy that comes from, from, a, from a result. And so... No matter who you are, uh, once you won a competition, it's a little bit like getting elected uh, for a political mandate. You, you have a majority, so to speak, for this project. And that means that you, after that, your position also in relation to the client is quite strong because the client might want to change things, but you can always hold this up and say, but we won this competition and there was a jury and there was a public and this is for everyone to see. And, and I think this kind of uh, this has to do with democracy. That's why that was my my first statement in the in the in the small talk. I think that the the democratic aspect is so important, and the legit legitimization that comes from a competition is so important that that uh, it's very 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 important that actually we look at not only the laboratory as an experimental field, which is one thing, but also as something that with the decision then is being somehow uh, approved publicly approved. So actually an experiment then becomes something elected. And this, this is the magic of democracy. Uh, and I think it's, uh, it's something we should really worship because it's, uh, it's absolutely not a given uh, to have that. Yeah, thank you. Lily, maybe? Yeah, that's definitely something we've experienced as well is that, that you then, you have, you've, you, you've actually taken the risk and that has given you the, 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 the position to actually then be respected as the architect that has come up with this idea. And that's a wonderful situation to be in. And we, we love, that's what, competitions is basically what we do, what we love to do. So I hope that there, there'll be more fun ones out there with, with clients that are just courageous. And yeah. Well said. <laughs> Bishara, one word. Well, I, I, don't, I haven't done competitions in a long, long time being like a scholar now. Uh, I would maybe look at it from the other side now from like studying the results of competitions and maybe uh, the fact that may, it's one thing to, to, to win a competition, I think it's nice. Uh, it's, it's just, it would be interesting. I think we talked about the databases. I think it's really interesting to go back to to all those projects that have not won. And, you know, yes, there's like a post-mortem that needs to be done. Like, why didn't we win? And why, why did we lose? And was the project better than ours or not? That's, that's, those are discussions that you could have. But I think every, every, even every losing project has some, still something to say. And by, by putting them in a database, by studying them, by comparing them with the others, like the, and again, I finished my presentation with uh, Ludovic Barlion's work on, on La Villette. He didn't concentrate his efforts on, on the winning scheme or the, the two winning, uh, the, the, the runner up. He really looked at all the, uh, the, the projects, even the losing ones. And, and this is where he came up with a theory on what an urban park is in the 21st century. So, so I think um, maybe to go back to the idea of the database, you know, every, every effort that's, that's been put in the competition is research in itself and needs to be recorded and, and studied in the future. It just can it shouldn't be forgotten once the competition is over and, and somebody wins it. Great, thank you. So Tina, I wanted you to end up, but uh, I will. So my, my little comment, first of all, thank you very much. Uh, you know, it's, it's always wonderful to have a, a discussion with experts, um, uh, you know, like you on competitions. I mean, Bechara and I have been trying to decipher the world of competition in our first book a while ago, but we are, I mean, what we learned last week clearly that, you know, Wilfred was, was talking about democracy. Well, you know, we, know, we now know if we didn't, 
democracy is not a given. So, you know, competitions are not um, a given in, in themselves. So we should be talking about, a, a, you know, full range of competition devices. And I know that Benjamin um, is very aware of that. So I think we have to be very careful when we have in a discussion, you know, what type of competition, in what context and so on. But it's even more true when we talk about innovation. There is a full range of innovative practices within competition. And I feel, you know, a lot of research is still needed because I don't feel yet that we are able to really uh, be that convincing in terms of what it really means <laughs> for a competition to um, open an innovative field. So I am, I'm still a bit in, in on my, uh, uh, you know, I think we need more debates, Tina, next year, <laughs> and we will refine. So thank you again for this wonderful invitation. Uh, thank you all, and I hope the public enjoyed. Uh, I, I, I understand that there were not so many questions from the public, Thomas. So again, thank you very much. I hope, I hope, hope it made sense for a, a few people. So thank you very much to you all. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Great discussion. Thank you.